please welcome Dr. Tracy Celia Brown and Ira Winkler. Well, hello there. Hi there. Wow, there are people here. I, I don't know about you, I would have been gone if I didn't have to be here, but thank you. <laughs> I'm told there's like other people in other rooms, it's like cool. So anyway, a couple different things. First, the, I'm told that there are people transcribing this, and I'm given if you know how fast I talk, I have to apologize to them in advance. And actually, while I'm thinking of it, they're not sure their reason for being there, and they don't know why they are no longer not, no, no, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> if they got that right, give them applause. Um, but on another note, so people always accuse me of trying to cut Tracy off because I have the clicker and I'm not giving it up. But usually that's because she takes these long dramatic pauses and it's completely unintentional. So anyway, there's that. So let's now talk about the actual topic of you can stop stupid. Yes. Because here's the thing. Everybody's like, oh, God, it's like another presentation calling our users stupid. When are we going to learn? If, you see, if you've ever heard me talk before, behind every stupid user is a stupider security professional. And let's talk a little bit about why that occurs. I was once, so about six months ago, I was at a conference in Iowa. I'll give John a pro, you know, little promo, CornCon in Iowa, always a good conference. And I was on the lunch line, and there was like a table to the side, and they had a bunch of these stickers that said, oh, it's a keynote, I can't curse. But anyway, the, the actual sticker said, don't click on stuff. And what happened was an admin guy was walking up in front of me. He's like, oh, I need a whole bunch of these stickers. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of these users that keep clicking on stuff. And I'm like, wow, you must give your users a lot of stuff. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, how can they click on stuff if you're not giving it to them? And by the way, if they're going to click on all this stuff, why aren't you like dealing with it after they click on it? Because you know they're going to click. What's wrong with you? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, so... You can kind of see where I'm going with this because everybody keeps focusing on the user as the proximity of the error. And the biggest problem we have in the security world is we look at the fact that when a user makes a mistake, it's the user that's the issue. I look at it that when a, the problem is not that users make mistakes, but that we put users in a position where they can initiate loss. They don't cause the loss, they initiate a chain of events. And that's a really critical issue to deal with. I guess I should have, it, okay, oh good. So anyway, let's talk about what is stupid. There's actually a dif dictionary definition of stupid, and this is kind of critical for us to understand. So the dictionary definition is having or showing a great lack of intelligence or common sense. That is literally what stupid means. But let's see, I think Tracy deals with this next. Oh my, yes. <laughs> so the question is, do we hire people with a great lack of common sense? And if that's the case, then whose fault is it? If we're hiring people with a great lack of common sense and putting them in a position that we say they're gonna be successful in, but they lack the common sense? I think that's a question that we need to do or take a look at. Likely, very not. Um, and we need to also question ourselves, if we're hiring people with a lack of common sense, why are we putting them in a position of responsibility where they need to behave, where they need to act in a certain way or follow specific instructions or even make decisions? And at most, put us in a position where we may have risk as a result of their actions. So maybe it's a fact that they might be lacking common sense. So if we go back to college psychology and we look at common sense, in order to have common sense, which comes from experience, we need to have common knowledge. So we need to understand what it is that we're doing in order to have common sense, right? So we look at ourselves and determine, are we providing common knowledge to our people? Are we giving them the training that they need in order to be successful? Or are we assuming that there's going to be failure? So we're hiring people with a lack of great knowledge. We're hiring them with a lack of common, uh, common sense. We're not providing them the knowledge that they need to be successful. So apparently, we must be assuming that they're going to fail. And if that's the case, what are we doing preemptively so that they don't? So I'll sum this slide up really like with a quote from the great philosopher of Peggy Bundy. If you give a monkey a gun, and the monkey shoots somebody, who do you blame? 
the monkey or the person who gave them the gun, or perhaps the adults around the monkey that didn't take the gun away. So, and now here's the thing. It's not really you out there. You know, again, everybody's like, well, first he's calling the user stupid. Now he's calling me stupid. It's like, no, it's not really you. Now let's talk no. about calling the awareness professional stupid. Really make friends with everybody on this presentation. <laughs> so here's the issue. When you stop and look at it, every time we look at user error, user initiated loss, we think of everybody looks at the user as the proximity of the error. And we'll talk about proximity later, but they think, the error is created by the user, which is where the proximity is. And then, of course, let's focus on that. You've been fed a bunch of crap about this whole thing. They want you to create the human firewall. They love to tout, we need to make the user our last line of defense. If you make the user the last line of defense, you really should be fired. You know, the human firewall, firewalls suck in general, let's face it. Do you really want a human which is less reliable to be your firewall? That's not how it should work. Users are just the proximity, but all you keep hearing about is we need to make the user stronger. We don't need to make the user stronger. That's the wrong type of science. If you ever work out, you know, they have what bro science, like protein bro, you know, give me my protein. It's like that's bro science. It's like fake science. It's specious. It sounds correct, but it's wrong. They say we need to learn from psychology. We need to learn from mental models. We need to learn marketing. And you know what? That has a place, but that has a really, really little place to apply. So let's... So anyway, everybody's focusing on the proximity of error. Next, here is really the overall message of this whole presentation. Everybody thinks, like if you take the lessons from the awareness profession, everybody thinks that, well, a user's making a mistake. We need a smarter user. We need to have the paragon of virtue in our users. We just need to give them more awareness training, better awareness training, funnier awareness training, whatever the case is. That's like saying if a canary dies in a coal mine, we need healthy your canaries. That's not how it should be. You need to go ahead and understand that the canary is a piece of the system. The canary is just the trigger to say, what are we really, what's the system for? The system, in theory, is to make sure people don't die in a coal mine. Gas, canaries die under less gas, well, you know, less concentration of gas than a person would. So when the canary dies, people know there's something wrong. The canary is part of the detection system. Much like if a user does something wrong, that user is just part of the system that has failed. So we need to understand when a user fails, it's a failure of the entire system from start to finish, not just this one little place where the, in, everything can be improved. So here's this fabulous gif of Newman from Seinfeld as an accountant or doing some accounting processes. So with this, we want to take a look at, do we think that a CFO is going to walk into an office one day and say, you know what? We kind of lost a lot of money, but humans aren't perfect. They make some mistakes. They probably need a little bit more training, maybe a little bit more awareness, or maybe we just need brand new humans in that space. No. The CFO's responsibility is to work with their team to make sure that there are the right policies, processes, structures in place for their people to be able to behave correctly. That what those processes are, that securities in the inside of it and woven from start to finish, right? So, for example, um, the CFO is going to let you know how a check needs to be distributed. There's a specific process. This needs to be done, this needs to be done, these people need to be contacted. We have separation of duties for signatures and then it goes out, right? And if this doesn't happen, then there are consequences to that. Either you're not gonna get paid, a payment will be delayed, something is going to be happen. But our critical functions, our critical operations are using a process from start to finish that is absolute and will get done. We need to make sure that it is correct. So it's not based off of just the user, just that one component or person, all right? So what a click. I'm told this is actually a fake clicker. It just sends a signal to somebody else to advance slides because they don't trust me. But now we're drowning. Now they just put the wrong slide. Oh, no, they have the right slide up. I have the wrong slide. So anyway, here's the thing. Now, what most people <laughs> don't know, is, I don't 
tell people. It's not like you should know, but I'm, I'm a certified as a master scuba diver trainer. It's just one of my things. I love scuba diving. I thought, how do I make it tax deductible so I could do it more? You become an instructor, so you theoretically make money off of it. So anyway, I'm a master scuba diver instructor, and in training to be an instructor, this is where I first heard the term, you can't stop stupid, because the instructor instructor, I guess that's what you call them, the instructor instructor was out there telling us, for example, oh, you can't stop stupid, because somebody's going to do something wrong. And I was like sitting there thinking, you know what? We're taking like hundreds of hours of instruction to stop stupid. Because when you think about it, and how many people in this room, just for my own benefit, are certified in scuba? Okay, about maybe 15% of people. Awesome. I like you guys. Anyway, the rest <laughs> of you, get trained. Okay. But anyway, so the 15% of you, you know that before you can be in, you know, get in the water is scuba-wise, you have to go ahead. You have to take a medical. They put you in a pool to make sure you're not going to freak out. You know, they say, oh, we want you to swim like 200 yards, but really it's just to make sure you don't freak out in the water. Then you have the medical forms, and then before we put you in scuba equipment, they give you like, you know, dozens of hours of training, primarily on how not to kill yourself, which is really the point. And then after that, then they're like, okay, we'll put you in a pool, and putting people in a pool for the first time, we make sure they don't freak out, that they can do basic skills that stop stupid, for lack of a better term. You know, they could do that, and then once they demonstrate that, then we go ahead and take them to open water. Now, the open water, this is a picture of like a class on a pl dive platform. This platform is not going to be more than 30 feet deep, and you know, generally it's hard to kill yourself in less than 30 feet. It can happen, but really hard. But anyway, so there you are in 30 feet of water, or usually a lot less and you have a small class. We get in there, and we're, this class has one instructor, and it looks like four or five students. And then the other part is, it's like the instructor has to pay attention going one skill to another from one student to another. A smart instructor also brings the circle back there is a, what's known as a, uh, like a di an assistant instructor or a dive master to watch the people just to make sure. And there was one time where I was like, you know, certifying a class, and then all of a sudden we're on the dive platform, and one guy on the edge, I notice in the corner of my eye, he decides to see what's under the dive platform. You know, no matter how many times we tell him, do not get off the platform once we go down, he decides to look under. But anyway, by that point in time, the assistant instructor I brought with me started pulling him up, and that was good. But then you stop and think, what happens if something goes wrong? What a lot of people don't know is before we are allowed to take students somewhere, in the first place, I'm insured, the dive, school, the dive school's insured, the facility where we go is insured, we know where all the hi hyperbaric chambers are in the local area, we have first aid kits, and so on. We know how to call doctors, ambulances, whatever. And this is all, and statistically, diving is safer than bowling. That, at least that's what they tell me. But statistically, diving is safer from bowling because they put all these protections in place, for lack of a better term, to stop stupid. And there's a whole process to that. Anyway, so let's talk about safety science, because really what I just embodied is the concept of safety science. A lot of people, when they talk user awareness, stopping user error, they always talk, you know, they always love to talk psychology, marketing, how to influence users. I want people to start thinking safety science. Everything I described previously about the scuba thing is essentially safety science. Safety science is a well-funded discipline, and what they do is they look at how people get injured in the workplace. And injuries in the workplace cost companies lots and lots of money. Somebody gets injured in a factory, for example, they might have to stop the whole factory production, costing them millions of dollars a day, if not more. And so what they do is they go through everything, but they look at the user who gets injured, not as the proximity of the error, but just as a part of the entire system. If that person got injured, it's a failure of the system from start to finish. They look at what enabled that, that person to be injured? Why was that person in a proximity to be injured? How was the response? How did we stop it from getting more injured? And so on. Again, though, the user is just the proximity of the error, should there be an error. And it's, again, a symptom. I keep repeating that, but it's so critical. So with that concept, the user and the proximity of the user to an error, let's take a look at the case of the 737 MAX 8. 
aircraft. So with that particular case, there was a system set up for error from start in design through commissioning and certification. The design of that particular engine was lifted above the wing, which changed the center of gravity for that particular aircraft. As a result, there were sensors at the front of the aircraft that engaged a new software program called MCAS. MCAS would then adjust the lift of the nose and turn the nose down in some cases, or in this case, when the pilots wanted to lift it up. So, in our first unfortunate and tragic incident, there are reports that state that they feel the pilots were in essentially a fight with the automated system of the aircraft because of all of these different environmental or components that were happening at that time. In the second tragic incident, we found that it looked like the pilots were able to override the system. Unfortunately, they did that too late and as a result, the plane crashed. Now, when I say a systematic failure, what we find later on through reports is that with the design of the engine, the change in the center of gravity, the sensors at the front, which also allowed for an indicator, a disagree indicator, that the pilots were used to having to let them know that there was a discrepancy in their system or that the incorrect data was being sent. They didn't have that anymore. Then the faulty sensors were, sa were sending incorrect data and incorrectly engaging the MCAS system, which caused the fight between the pilot and the plane. Now, at the same time, in the background of that environmental system we have, or that system overall, we have a sped up process that's fast tracking the aircraft through commissioning and eventually certification. So, through the second incident, we're able to see that, is it possible that the pilots were able to stop? this in the process? Maybe because eventually they learned that they could override the MCAS system. But there was everything against them. They had bad sensors sending bad data, engaging a system, engaging a software system that they didn't know existed. In the meantime, they were only provided about two hours worth of iPad training prior to ever getting into the cockpit. And then you have the fast tracking of the aircraft through certification. So this is what we mean by it's not just the pilot error, right? The pilots were initially blamed for the crash. However, through additional investigation, we found that there were multiple points where there were failures involved from start to finish. So if we take that concept and apply it to how we look at our users and security in our business functions, what type of an environment, what type of a culture are we creating for our people so that they are successful, so that they are mitigating risk? Are we providing them with the right processes in place, with the right regulations? Are we following our own rules? How are we as a whole contributing to that? Or how are we as a whole leveraging our professional skills, our knowledge and experience in security, and helping our business so that they're successful from start to finish? So where does blame fall? Again, going back to safety science, not all these bro sciences, but safety science with hard data, not just, well, we just need users to be more aware. Where does the blame fall? Statistically, they do studies and show that 90% of injuries, of, where, of, of workplace injuries, are the result of the environment not the result of the people doing something or other. In other words, like in a hardcore factory environment, like there's one place, I, I think I might have told this story before to RSA, but you know, in one case, they were basically having accidents in a uh, warehouse where people were being hit by forklifts. And so what they ended up deciding to do was draw a line down the, uh, line down the aisles and say, people stay on one side, forklifts stay on the other. That cut down 90% of injuries from forklift accidents accidents. What were the last 10%? People on their iPads wandering into a forklift or a forklift driver looking some other way driving into a user. That's where these things happen. It happens in the same thing. Think about phishing messages. Why do people click on phishing messages? It's like, well, 90% of the problem is that the users have the phishing message in their inbox, not that they actually click. The pilot error, I mean, Tracy just went through the whole thing. Yeah, maybe 10% of that whole 737 debacle was a result of the pilots not doing certain things perfectly, 
but the other 90% was causing them, staring them in the wrong directions most of the time. And that's frankly what we're dealing with in the cybersecurity world as well. 90% of the environment is driving, or, or the environment is driving users to 90% of where they make their error, either because they're in the wrong position to make the error, or they're put in the wrong position, or they're not giving training, or whatever. But what is the last 10%? Because again, there is a purpose for awareness training. What's the last 10%? Last 10%, you know, from accident perspective, safety perspective, carelessness. Yes, people do dumb things. People don't pay attention. They're on their iPad. They're trying to listen to music and open up another application while doing their work. They, that happens. Sometimes there's blatant ignorance where they just don't know what they're doing, how they're doing. I would argue that's a little bit of training. Sometimes there's willful ignorance. Nothing's going to overcome, no training's going to overcome that. And then here's another thing we forget. When we start talking about awareness to prevent user-created user incidents, malice, sometimes users just want to create incidents. They're doing things purposefully. The system, frankly, going back to accounting as an example, the system doesn't care why users do something, nor should it care why they do it. They just care that at some point they initiate the loss, and we have to try to overcome that initiation of the loss. But anyway, awareness training might fit in on this 10%, but it's still only 10% of the problem. And let's talk about, but at the end of the day, awareness is, itself is only going to deal with 20% of that 10%. And there's the concept of applied behavioral science. Applied behavioral science are the ABCs of behavioral science, because, you know, ABC, an antecedent is essentially information. It's awareness training, whatever you want to call it, is supposed to drive behaviors. It's supposed, well, I guess the better word is it kind of influences behaviors. Then, as a result of behavior, you get a consequence. You know, and the consequence itself reinforces the behavior, or it can discourage the behavior. So for example, um, I use the example, if I'm in a restaurant, server comes over, tells me the plate is hot, I go, I'm a man, give me that plate. I go to grab the plate, I singe my fingers, I try to act like I'm cool, no problem here. I put the plate down, I try to pull my skin off and everything like that. And then what happens is the next time the server shows up with a plate of ice cream, I'm like, oh no, please, right here for you. Why? Because I suffered the consequence. And now here's part of the issue you have to understand. Too often, there's a positive consequence for a negative behavior. For what's the consequence, for example, for reusing your password on like your Amazon account that you would for your work account? There is no consequence. It's actually a positive consequence because it gives you one less password to know. So you got to understand that consequences are much more impactful, four times more impactful than just providing information. So anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit more. You want to create the environment now. Anyway. So with this, we posit this particular model, or a model like it, but we'll start with this. So here you've probably seen something really similar referred to as boom or flash boom or flash bang, right? The moment where an incident is taking place. The user is there, they've got something in front of them, and boom, there's the action that starts the chain of events. But we also have left of boom, which is our preemptive measures, and then our right of boom, our preemptive measures, and our left of boom, military right, military left, and our left to boom, right, which is our response and what we do to recover from that. But we are going to start with boom. So with this particular model, we got this from military and counterterrorism strategy, right? This was what was conducted in the military across the board. And we start with boom here, right? We start with the user and the proximity of the user to an event or the start of a user-initiated loss. So boom here is the explosion. OK. Um, yeah, so anyway, left the boom on this slide is what led to the explosion, for example. You know, like, so if you're dealing with an explosion at a high level, it's like, well, you're, from a counterterrorism perspective, you're like, how did the terrorists get into the, the position where they have a bomb? How did they get trained? How did they put things there? Then likewise, from a terrorism, counterterrorism perspective, you know, for example, that they might go ahead and they might try, for example, to 
blow up the Pentagon. You know, not to downplay something like the 9-11 attacks, but what a lot of people don't know is that the Pentagon actually went through a series of hardening in the, like, the recent, in the, like a couple years before the 9-11 attacks. So the deaths at the Pentagon and the damage to the Pentagon was significantly decreased because they put a whole bunch of protection around that, knowing that at some point the Pentagon might be a potential attack. Then there was the boom, the actual boom. Then you have to go ahead and left the boom is essentially saying, how do we approach the, our reaction? Do we plan for secondary explosions, for example, like the Boston Marathon bombing? The Boston Marathon bombing, I, you know, again, I hate to learn off tragedies, but that's one of the better places to learn. The, one of the problems with that was, was that there was a secondary explosion. There was the initial explosion. First responders started going in, and a few minutes later, there was a secondary explosion. And first responders and people preparing for a strategy have to know how do we mitigate the likelihood or the damage resulting from secondary attacks while we do have to respond. You know, what happens if there's poisonous gases? How do we deal with that proactively? What happens We've if we have to shut before. down a city or something? With the railroad tracks, right, and derailments yeah. as well. So we can take lessons absolutely from terrorist attacks, but we can also take um, lessons from emergency management. So if we look at railroad derailments, what do we do to the right of boom in order to prepare? We've gone through the process of putting stickers on different um, boxcars to make sure that people understand that there's hazardous materials. We've gone through the process of running these tracks through less densely populated areas, and then we know that at some point a boom is going to occur. So to the left of boom, what are we doing to respond to that? Do we have the right procedures in place afterwards for medical care? Do we know the emergency responders that need to come into place to take care of any chemical spills? So the same type of process process or, or model applies with not only counterterrorism, but with emergency remediation and even in our own organizations. Yeah. So anyway, this is where we start the concept of user-initiated loss, and we really want to drill it in because if you get nothing else out of this presentation, the problem is not an unaware user. The problem is not that a user causes loss. The user never causes a loss. You're enabling that. They initiate a chain of events. This is the most critical thing to take away. A user should never be able to click on an email message and ruin your network because I said this, well, almost a dozen years ago. <laughs> if a user can click, if a user can click on an email and ruin your network, your network sucks. The user can just potentially initiate a chain of events that is completely expected in almost all cases. So the user is not the person who fails. It's the system that fails. The user, again, in this case, is just the canary in the coal mine. The user is the proximity of the loss. So you want to stop the potential for user-initiated loss. And then once you stop the potential for user-initiated loss, no matter what you do, something is always going to happen. You want to stop the realization of the loss after it's been initialized. So again, much like, sorry, I'm bad at this. Um, left a boom, boom, and right a boom. Don't know my right from my left usually. So anyway, you want to mitigate the loss. So left a boom, start there. How do you prevent the user from being in the position to initiate the loss? Because everybody talks about, we want to empower the users. I'm like, no, you don't. You really don't want to empower the users. You want the users to have the capability. You want to have the users to have the knowledge, skills, and ability to do their job properly. And some people, maybe you want to give them the ability to serve their customers better. That doesn't mean you keep throwing on functionality they don't need. You don't throw on accesses they don't need. You don't do all this stuff and give them all this capability. Frankly, what you need to do is you need to stop them from being in the position to initiate loss. It's not just taking away capability, it's also filtering out the attack. So for example, anti-malware, anti-phishing software, that filters out that type of attack from getting to them. There's a whole bunch of other ways. Locking the door stops, you know, malicious people from entering the facilities and getting into positions where they could steal things or manipulate users. Same thing like, for example, putting like caller ID on telephone systems so that when somebody calls in, they can't pretend to be from inside the company. You're going ahead and you're doing the left-to-boom procedures to stop 
potential attacks from a, reaching the user. Or I shouldn't say potential attacks, they might be attacks, but stopping the ability for a loss to be initiated at the user once it gets there. And same thing, creating a culture. You know, there was one time where, so for example, I was, I, when I left the NSA, I went to work for a government contractor, and I went, came into the office one day, and it was like my third, fourth day on the job. I get a call from the security manager. He's like, Ira, can you come into my office? I'm like, okay. So I walk into the office. He's like, Ira, are you missing anything? I'm like, not that I know of. He's like, you are. Want to guess what it is? I'm like, are we going to play 20 questions, or you want to tell me what I'm here for? He's like, where's your burn bag? I go, I don't have a clue, but I'm assuming you're going to hand it to me any moment now. And he went ahead and he handed me the burn bag. He's like, you know, you're supposed to lock it up every day. I'm like, no, I didn't. Maybe I did, but I forgot. Never locked up the burn bag again. Why? Because there was a culture in place that everybody locked it up and he had his guards do rounds after everybody left. And if there was a burn bag left unattended and unlocked, he would have them bring it back and have note where it came from. And then he'd call up and that was the last time my burn bag was out. But that culture created consequences that had me doing things right. So anyway, that's left a boom, which stopped a whole bunch of other stuff. And here's the other part, governance. Here's a big problem with awareness training. And again, we're still left a boom. The biggest problem with awareness training is we're training people how to, um, well, no, actually, I'm going to cover that later. But governance in this perspective is defining process. In other words, what is the process for doing something? What's the process for distributing PII? What's the process for you know, handling computers, what's the process for, for example, um, decommissioning computers, what's supply chain processes? There's a whole bunch of processes, and the problem is, in the cybersecurity world, we don't outline these things clearly. We basically just have these things, and it's like, it kind of should happen this way, or it does happen. You know, for example, mergers and acquisitions. Luckily, lately, people are establishing clear sets of processes and how we review potential companies we're looking at to join into the corporate network and so on. But, you know, frequently those things don't happen. And I'm talking the big things, but stop and think how many of the little user functions you have are actually defined by governance and defined well? And how many of those are actually written down and provided to our users so that they can act appropriately? If they have an opportunity to, sh to initiate a loss, do they know what to do? Do they know how to act to, in order to mitigate risk? Are they prepared to detect something that could be potentially malicious or potentially risky? If they do pre detect it, are they able to prevent it? Do they know what to do? Do they have access to the resources? Do they know how to sound the alarm, send out a communication, or make a phone call? Have we provided that with that, that, them with the information that they need? But also with the understanding that our people are going to act willfully. Sometimes they will act maliciously. Their actions could be um, fraudulent. It could be an accident at the same time. But the user is there in the middle, right there, proximity to boom. So now here's the thing. This is where I was going with the last set of governance. And again, governance goes throughout. And in the cybersecurity world, we do not use governance like it should be. Governance should define every step in an entire process in the company. We don't do that in cybersecurity. But here's the biggest problem, and especially this is where awareness training tends to fail people. Awareness programs love to train people to be on the lookout for the wascally wabbit. They talk about all the hackers. They talk about how bad people will social engineer you. They talk about how, you know, there's all these incidents. Somebody will steal your computer. Somebody will call you up and do bad things. Things. The problem is that they're training users to just be Elmer Fudds. They're not training users how to do their job right. There is, it sounds like a fine line, but I want my users to know how to do their jobs right. What is the process to do right? Just for example, how many of you in this audience, and if you want to just be funny, in the other audiences, how many of you have to submit travel reimbursement forms out of this? You know, just about everybody. You know, when you submit your travel reimbursement form, let me ask you, did they say, oh, well, here's a mistake you might make, here's a mistake you might make, or did they say, you need receipts for your hotel, you need receipts for your restaurant, you can't have this, blah, blah, blah. They gave you very specific instructions on how to fill out travel vouchers right. And what happens if you do not fill that out right? 
You do not get your $20,000 hotel bill reimbursed in this area, <laughs> right? Because they will not do it if you don't have the proper receipts. That is governance. Do we do this in cybersecurity? Or are we training people, be on the lookout for those bad people? As opposed to telling people, here's how you do your job properly, and how you do your job properly should take care of the bad things as well. Will it take care of everything? No but it's going to take care of 99% of the problems a user might face. Because at the end of the day, awareness training, training people to be on the lookout for the wascally wabbit, you're putting your end user in combat with a sociopath, with a trained criminal. Do you, is that a fair fight? That's not a fair fight. It's like, I saw a funny video, and now that I saw that funny video, I can take on the master criminals. No way. You want to make sure they know how to do their job from start to finish and not be Elmer Fudds. Okay, so now write a boom. In this case, the loss has been initiated. In other words, let's say a user clicked on a phishing message. Let's say the user might go click on a website to give away their credentials, just as an example. And phishing's an easy one because everybody's familiar with that. It's not the only example. But now the loss has been initiated. The user clicked on the message, and they're attempting to go to a website. Does your architecture tell you, this is a malicious link. We're not sending you there. You can do that. The architecture is set up proactively in many cases if you have the right antivirus software, whatever the case. Well, not just antivirus software, but web content filtering and so on. Does the environment expect it? Look, you know, much like that guy who said, you know, laughing at his people that he needs stickers that said, don't click on stuff. I'm trying to make sure I say it right. <laughs> don't click on stuff. You know, that's not exactly the environment. The guy knows people are going to click on stuff. Does he set up the environment so that people have least privileges, so that they can't be infected with ran infect the entire network with ransomware? Are there the appropriate protections in place? And is there an analysis of user-initiated loss? In other words, what are the possible actions a user can take that can initiate a chain of events? And let's figure out proactively how to mitigate that. Again, there's access controls, there's permissions, there's a whole bunch of, you know, there's countless things. Like we just had, I don't know, 2,300 vendors. Oh, sorry, I forgot. A few vendors showed up, did not show up. So we had 2,286 vendors this year or something like that. But there are people who can help you deal with this. But again, you got to look both at left a boom, at boom, and right a boom, and figure out where that all can be implemented. Now, most important, after there's an incident, figure out what happened, what went right, what went wrong. You know, all too frequently, people just look at, oh, we need better awareness training. I'm like, that's the last, that's the least of your thoughts. You need to figure out how did that attack hit that user? How, why did the user make a mistake? Like, you know, again, there was like, okay, so if you go back a few years, like, I think it was actually 2013, the Syrian Electronic Army really hates me. I don't know if you remember them, but they did a whole series of hacks against major websites, and they really came after me. And why? Because I, dis you know, I disclosed their names and did a whole bunch of other stuff at RSA. They hacked the RSA conference website because of me. I was kind of honored. So what happened was, and a true story, but what happened was you go back and people would be hit by the Syrian Electronic Army. They'd call in all the big incident response companies. The companies would come in and take away any malware that these people put in place. And then they'd come back and get, and then what would happen is a week later, these bad people would be back in the networks. And then, so then they call me and they're like, Ira, figure out why they're back in. So I came in, I said, okay, why, you know, and this is a true story. I was talking to the CFO of a multi-billion dollar company. I go, you're a smart guy, no offense. I go, just out of curiosity, why'd you click on this message? It's clearly a fake. And he's like, well, he's like, I woke up at 6 a.m. in the morning, and the guy was British, you know, in New York, though, but the guy was British, and he's like, I got a message from our UK sales rep, and the UK sales rep said, we were featured in the BBC, and click on this link to see the story, and he clicked on the link to see the story, of course, it, you know, ended up compromising his credentials. I'm like, okay, did anybody ever tell you how to check for a malicious link on your iPhone? It's like, no. I'm like, really? 
And then I'm like, which videos? And it's like, go back and look at your awareness videos and see how to check for a malicious link. It's not there. But anyway, so we went back and then we started implementing emergency awareness programs just for that attack. Now that's just one case. But again, think about all the other times users were put in the position and they were never given this. So go back, figure out why they did stuff. Because it's your users aren't the stupid ones. It's the environment that enabled them to appear stupid. And it may sound difficult. It may seem pretty daunting as well. But we see it in other industries. We see it in other areas of our organization. We see it even in processes that we do in IT or in security. So it is something that we can implement. And as we said earlier, sometimes we don't care if the person knows why they're doing something just as long as they do it correctly. So it's up to us as the professionals in security to work with the business to make sure that they implement that in those processes, that they have security in mind. And as a result of having security in mind when they create these processes, that we create systemically a security culture that is robust. So let's consider this. It, we've probably beat this one to death. Uh, and you've seen it quite a few times that 90% of the incidents are a result from the user being the single point of entry. They are the start of a user-initiated loss, right? So we posit this particular strategy to you with right, left, and boom to use for your own organizations. But it should be worth it. Right? So take a look and see, do you have something in place to analyze what processes are out there within your organization? Do you have something in place where you can create champions of security? Or do you have partnerships with other people within the organization so that you can help them and let them leverage the expertise that you have available to them so that we can create this culture of security within our companies? So anyway, let's use a quick example, because again, I'm talking around, throwing different examples all over the place. But let's look at, you know, we're in, in the United States, and we are in the United States at the moment. You know, we're looking at W-2 fraud season, because tax season, for those of you from outside the country, W-2s are tax forms that everybody has to get at the beginning of the year to prepare to mail in them, process tax returns, and so on. So what happens is the typical attack is that a bad guy goes ahead and sends and phishing message into human resources of some way and says, I'm the CEO, we just hired a new accounting firm or whatever it is, and we need you to send out all the W-2 information to our new accounting firm. And it has to be done immediately because we're running late, our users are mad, and all that sort of stuff. So then you have this low-level person sitting there thinking, is this the wascally wabbit or is this the CEO or whatever? So here's how the process should work the way we're describing applying a boom type of strategy. First, what should happen is obviously you have your anti-spam filters, anti-phishing filters, and so on, and that should filter out attacks. Likely you can put the messages flagged as external and a variety of other ways to do it. So then the message should never reach the inbox of the potential I'll call it the user in this case, or the victim. And then what happens is, when it gets to the victim, the victim should think, OK, wait a second. They shouldn't be thinking, I had awareness training, and it was funny, and I learned that that could be the wascally wabbit, not the CEO. That, they shouldn't, that shouldn't enter their mind. They should say, hey, wait a second. This is a request for PII. A request for PII has to be sent through the head of HR, who then has to have the general counsel's approval to send out the information. Yes, this is the CEO. The CEO doesn't even know who I am anyway. But either way, my job is to process requests for PII by sending it to the head of HR. So that's what should theoretically happen. And they should have the training and how to do that and so on. And then let's assume that for whatever reason, the user fails to do the proper thing and escalate, or even let's assume that the head of HR falls for the trick. Then what should happen is they send it out, but then it should be blocked by data leak prevention software, DLP, and a whole bunch of other filtering software that says, why are you sending this file outside of the company or whatever else? But that's how the process should work. It doesn't just train the end user to say, is this the wascally wabbit? There's a whole system in place that should be trying to stop it from getting there, trying to get a process to how the, how, help the user make the right decision, and then the assumption that inevitably the user will fail and, the, and proactively protect against that. So anyway, also consider the overlap. I just gave the example of W2 handling, but couldn't that work for any type of request for PII? 
that could work there. You know, anti-phishing technology, anti-spam technology, again, that should filter out any type of attacks, in theory. Data leak prevention, again, that should filter out any sort of data accidentally being sent out of the company, either maliciously, intentionally, via phishing, or whatever else. There's a whole bunch of overlap that if you just look at one process, you're going to stop a litany of attacks. Wow, I barely ever use that word, litany. Anyway, but it stops a litany of attacks. So anyway, oh, the whole thing can stop a lot. Now, here, I think we beat that one to death. Yeah. OK, next slide. Go ahead. Okay, so here's the thing though. Awareness is still mandatory. Yes, I beat up on awareness to a certain extent, but the reality is awareness is still one of the tactics in the overall strategy. And let me just go on for this because, you know, but I actually, one quick thing back on this slide. Here's the thing with awareness. The awareness should not be focusing on, be on the lookout for the wascally wabbit. Awareness should be focused on how do, you do, how do you do your job properly? What is the process? How do you implement the process properly? That's what awareness should focus on. But either way, awareness is still mandatory because awareness is a tactic. Too many people in the awareness field like to think it's a whole strategy to be be the human firewall in the last line of defense. That's not what it's there for. It's one tactic. It's sort of like having tanks. You need armor to win a war. But you can't win the war with armor alone. You could set a whole bunch of people and take over and blow up a city with a whole bunch of tanks, but you're not going to hold the city without infantry, without air support, and a whole bunch of other resources. Same thing with awareness training. Your user, quote unquote, user problem, is not just being, it's not an awareness strategy. It's awareness is a tactic among governance, among technology, among process and awareness. So that's the key point. Awareness is a tactic. But most important takeaway, you're not trying to create healthier canaries. You need to look at creating a system that's not worried about lack of user awareness, but a system that's focused on user-initiated loss and stopping user-initiated loss both from being initiated and then from mitigating it after initiation, because there's no such thing as perfect security. Much like I was laughing about that admin who says he needs a whole bunch of stickers because his users keep clicking on stuff, you know, it's a, he kept giving his users stuff to click on. That's his fault. You need to understand, likewise, it's you're creating a system to stop this from start to finish. Sorry, here's your mandatory slide. <laughs> <laughs> In the end, we actually believe that you guys are magic. You're fantastic. We, we really believe you are magic. Nothing can stand in your way. And this right up here will help you apply that concept when you get back to work, right? So <laughs> thanks. Immediately when you get back, you can analyze your governance and see what you currently have in place in order to put this type of a model into effect, right? Do you focus on the proximity of the user to boom, the proximity of the user is it really the user's fault? And if it is, what are we doing preemptively and what are we doing in response and how are we implementing a feedback loop? Um, is there an end-to-end -end approach for that user-initiated loss? And are you considering what those gaps are in order to fill them? And then within the next three months, we hope that you choose at least a couple of common user-initiated losses within your organization and then use this model or something in order to help your business partners um, implement the right type of strategy so that you're users can do the right thing when they need to do it. So anyway, cheap plug. I'm doing a book signing. Well, I wasn't supposed to, but the bookstore is right there. I'll sign my book if you go there. Anyway, Tracy also has a book. And then Tracy and I both have a new book. We need votes. Which do people like as the cover? The one on the, oh, sorry, the one on the left or the one on the right? Sorry, we need a quick poll. This is actually real. How many people like the one on the left? Okay, how many people like the one on the right with the stop sign? Wow. Wow, we have a winner. No offense to you people who chose wrong. It's not like <laughs> Indiana Jones, though. But anyway, um, <laughs> otherwise, so you can email us. We have one minute and 30 seconds exactly for questions, which I don't think they'll like me, let us do, because they're going to kick us out and kill me if we go long. Or anyway. But we'll take questions. We're not leaving. Nobody's behind us anyway, since they gave us the honor <laughs> of the very last session at RSA. Thank you so very much. So <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
So let us know if you have questions. In the meantime, we hope that you enjoyed RSA, and then we hope that you got something out of valuable of the session. Thanks. Thank so, not question. <laughs> oh, you can ask. I don't care. Yeah, either one. Uh, not so much a question, just a request that next year you deliver at least half the presentation in concert. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Thought she will actually do that. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I've never heard her do Olivia Newton John before, but it worked. Anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.